the CFC. CFC, the classic film channel. The channel that makes you say, we might as well, there's nothing else on. Out of Bounds, the true story of a true Hollywood true disaster. Episode 2, Breaking Your Leg. Yeah, breaking a leg. That's what we in the biz call getting all the actors together and selected. Because, of course, when you break your leg, you have to get a cast. You'd be amazed the people I have to explain that to. And how was getting the cast? Breaking a leg. How was breaking... I mean, I literally just told you that's what I call it, and you just ignored me. There's no other way people use that phrase. How was breaking the leg on Fresh Balls? How was what? Breaking the leg. I, I don't understand the question. Getting the cast together. For Fresh Balls? Well, yes. Breaking a leg on Fresh Balls was a pretty roundabout go around the mulberry bush. <laughs> that's what I call the casting process. It's... Breaking a leg, not the leg. That's why you confuse me. And he's done it. Stephen Curtis has won Wimbledon. He has won every Grand Slam this year. He must be overjoyed. Oh, oh, he's crying. He's on the floor. Oh, this is a great sight. Oh, wait. Oh, oh security's now on the court. The ball was out! Yes, Mr. McEnroe has gone over and began beating the paraplegic Mr. Curtis with his racket. Stay down, bitch! As he weeps on the floor. Oh, 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 I'm the one in the wrong! Curtis moved into the world of charity and began on his next project. A project that cynically he felt would make him rather rich and help his charitable endeavors. That project was turning his incredible life into a feature-length screenplay. That screenplay became On the Line, later, of course, Fresh Balls. I asked Lucio Lapine how he came to know of the Stephen Curtis story. Well, I was, of course, good friends with McEnroe, and so I'd heard about the terrible fight where John was inappropriately villainized after what Stephen did to him. Writer James Murphy nearly completed a biography of Lucio Lapine, However, eventually returned to his work chronicling the JFK assassination. Here's James now. Lucio was friends with many stars. Chief amongst them in the period of Curtis's victory was indeed McEnroe. Lucio was also an avid defender of McEnroe, no matter how outrageous the exploit was. Over the years, in fact, Lucio began to distance himself from McEnroe as he got less crazy. Film critic Harold Ryan... It was well known that due to a tax evasion case and a whistleblower in his studio, Lucio was a very paranoid man. He had hidden tapes everywhere. Writer, James Murphy. But before Lucio threw me off the project of the book, I did manage to gather certain tapes from these hidden recordings. And I did find one entitled Hidden Flower Pot Cripple Tennis Meeting. I also found tapes entitled JFK talk with top CIA guy with moustache and later in life a tape called Bush possible hotel construction talk dated 2000. I also found blueprints and plans for a possible hotel on Greenwich Street in Manhattan. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Yes, it is where you're thinking. When I played the tape it had been recorded over with Lucio practicing a soft rock number on his guitar. Ricky, don't lose that number. <laughs> yeah, Ricky. One comment remained from the original recording. Georgie boy, bushy boy, you are one crazy son of a bitch. I did once ask him what was on the tape originally, and his response was, I don't fly planes, so I don't understand the question. Although we wish we could possibly give vital information surrounding the World Trade Center disaster, you are now instead about to hear an extract from the meeting with Stephen Curtis. Stefan, I love the script. Stephen. Is that your last name? No, uh, my first. Your name is Stephen Stefan? No, my name is Stephen Curtis. But we can change that, right? But this is a true story. <laughs> You're kidding. No. That's incredible. Uh, thank you. So you actually did all that? 
Yes, I did. Wow. Well, all my notes were about how it's a bit of a stretch that this stupid crippled guy even got in the court. Wow. Good going, pal. Thank you. <laughs> That's great news for the bottom line, too, because people love a true story. The Great Escape, Serpico, Easy Rider. Easy Rider wasn't a true story. Stefan, trust me. If you've done a pound of blow of Dennis Hopper, then you'd know that film's a goddamn documentary. I had other offers from other producers. However, Lucio outbidded them all. He must have really loved the script. I've never been outbidded on a script. I once paid over $15 million for a Star Wars ripoff script. They didn't even change the names. Some guy named Lucas kept bidding me up, so I ended up buying it for a ridiculous amount and then paid another $20 million in legal fees when some guy named George took me to trial for copyright infringement. Anyway. I reworked the script, and eventually, that became Driving Miss Daisy. The script for On the Line stayed on the shelves, until, as aforementioned in our previous episode, Lapine's plans for a raunchy tennis comedy, along with his issues with the WGA, led him to take On the Line off the shelves and refashion it into the film that, for better or for worse, we all know of today. I was never informed that such drastic changes were being made, and neither was Milton. Milton, in fact, had already learned all his lines from the original script. Helena Neyman, Milton's wife at the time of filming. Milton was a child of the theatre. Uh, quite literally, he was conceived backstage at the Gill Guild when a delivery boy arrived to Milton's mother. The famed Shakespearean actress, Lufette de Wheeler. While she was in a production of Lear, folks say he had quite the package. I will die bravely. Like a smug bridegroom. Uh, uh, yes, a smug bridegroom. Uh, mm, a smug bridegroom uh, uh, who struts his place on the stage. Uh, got the wrong fucking play now. David Frost once interviewed Milton Hopkins. What's your opinions of actors who don't have such devotion to the arts as you do? Well, they are not actors, are they, darling? They are little pongy boys and snivelling women who prance and dance and stumble their way through devilishly good works and get paid for it. Not unlike a whore. Yeah, if you want to succeed in this business, you must surrender to the work. You roll up your sleeves, get on your knees, and take it like a man. Not unlike, well, a whore. I'm sorry, which one of you is the whore again? They have no respect for the craft. It is merely a check to them, a bolster to getting high and laid. <laughs> If I had a hammer and enough time, then there would be no more untrained actors on London stages. Mr. Hopkins, are you genuinely declaring that you would commit mass murder on untrained actors? Either that, or send them to Broadway. As long as I don't have to hear another mumbled much ado, or ham-fisted Hamlet, or what other bollocks they wish to bastardise our boards with. Mr. Frost, what are you doing with my water jug? Milton, this is pure gin. Incorrect. I can smell it. It is not pure gin. It's vodka gin. For creative pursuits and tax purposes, Milton moved to Azerbaijan later in his life and took up cobbling, and was hence unable to comment for this podcast series. What we have managed to gather is from interviews over the years with Hopkins and candid talks with his wife Helena from around the period of filming. Oh, well, I can't say I'm going to be exactly thorough. We were pissed as old tarts when he made the tennis booby movie. Producer Lucio Lapine. Of course, my next job was to find a funny writer, not a boring guy like Stephen was. To punch up the comedy of the script, or for that matter, add any, Lapine turned to an up-and-coming comedy writer by the name of Wendy Cruz. Lucy O'Neill is a modern feminist film critic and essayist who has written about Wendy Cruz multiple times. Lucy O'Neill. In typical fashion for the time, Wendy was breaking into boys' club. She was the first female writer for Buffoon magazine. However, Wendy's lasting legacy will undoubtedly be her ghostwriting. 
Wendy Cruz did script punch-ups from the majority of the Best Picture winners of the 80s and many Best Comedies of the 90s. Wendy Cruz. I needed to get paid. That's really all there was to it. I liked writing. People thought I was funny and they wanted to bang me. Joan Rivers always ended her early sets with a joke about the casting couch saying, I'm Joan Rivers and I put out. Well, I stole that line except I had no pension for comedic delivery and hence, I became one of the most popular writers in Hollywood. Critic Lucy O'Neill. Wendy's other major legacy, of course, was that she was a dynamic queer writer in a time where such a thing was not something you shouted about. Everybody knew Wendy had girlfriends and boyfriends, and that was pretty revolutionary for the time. I think people thought I was a comedian long before I ever established myself as one. Because I would say openly things like, I'm bisexual, or I think women should be paid the same as men. And a lot of people would laugh at me as if I was joking. So a lot of my early sets were filled with crowds of both racist bigots and dynamic gender-bending artists of the 60s Greenwich Village scene. My sets were famous for private investigators to come and take pictures of the many conservative senators who, of course, would end up in glory holes with a German transgender beat poet. I always thought that was pretty cool, actually. I often ended up getting a cut. I asked Lucio Lapine why he hired Wendy Cruz. I'd known of her a little. We'd crossed paths at Milton Berle's third niece's bar mitzvah. I admired Wendy's comedic ability, her wit, and her capability at turning a phrase. He just wanted to bang me. I also felt it was extremely important to have homosexual writers in the filmmaking arena. Ms. Cruz identifies as queer, not homosexual. I thought you couldn't call him that no more. If that's how they identify, then that's how they want to be referred to as. I call one goddamn secretary named Lawrence that, and I got to pay him off in court. But now, I got a free pass? <laughs> Does that mean that I can start again calling people I like- have no idea what you were going to say, but I'm going to stop you. Lucio didn't know I was gay at all until I told him. He did, however, repeatedly inform me of his duty to get me back on the natural path. That was, of course, unless he could bang me and my then-girlfriend. Hack contemporary critic Richard Fonde. Everybody knew that Wendy had her hands on the best scripts of the decade, but it was one of those things I think we took for granted. If she'd have made a film of her own, then people would have flooded to the theaters. I did eventually make two films. Uh, the first was a huge commercial failure, and the second coined the term career killer and never work againer. Of course, many people in the industry have such disasters. What do you think, since you apart from those other industry people? How vulgar can I be? Moderately. My pussy. That moderate enough for you? Yeah, that's... Uh, that'll be fine. With an original dramatic script focusing on trauma currently being completely reinvented into a sexy farce with a primary plotline of a confused pair of jock straps, the Pine now made moves to hire a director. And again, put above all else matters of creativity and vision when making his decision. Crazy old Maurice. I sent my assistant out to find a hot young director used to, you know, doing sexy stuff. I was told that Maurice was the king of early 60s experimental French filmmaking and was now making those same sort of sexy fusses in America. I have the camera, they have their bodies, I have a tripod, they have their penises, I erect mine, they erect theirs. We begin shooting and we make love on the film and we make love in the film and after we have a nice dinner, this, listen to me now, this is filmmaking. They were pornos. He was shooting pornos in the San Fernando Valley. I did at one time make a few films of a profoundly sexual nature, but in France, this is Disney. This is family friendly. In France, art is admired, not shamed. Whereas in your America, artists are quite literally murdered. This guy was making movies called Lawrence of My Labia and wants to talk about art? Well-revered and much-hated critic Stephen Sklar. Maurice Lepay began like 
all insufferable French artists in the underbelly of the new wave cinema scene. The winner of the prestigious Puckering Flower Audience Award at the Shadow de Shitta Awards in Florence comes Maurice Lopet's thrilling new work of new wave cinema for the first time in America. Your hat is gone, madame. You're wearing it. <laughs> you caught me. I thought you were a blind woman. I am not blind. I am a woman. Blind women. What a world they must feel. The many faces of a woman trying to find herself in a world of men, told from the point of view of those men and a couple of scenes where the woman is alone, bathing naked. Garnered by critics such as Richard Fonde as the best thing in French I've seen this year, and if I remember rightly, I'm sure I saw something else this year, maybe. Art is truth, and truth is art, and the rest is shit. A literal piece of a piece of shit. And actress Bridget Bolden, at her bold, bare, and brazen best, appearing as a college professor rallying against the depiction of women in media. Women above all else are sexualized in the media. More bold, more brazen, and much, much, much more bolden. A woman is so much more than her body parts. Not since the cave woman's dance has there been so much bolden. So much of the magic, the mystery, the mischief, the misdemeanors, and the animal attraction and allergies that has made her the screen's second most exciting large-bosomed alliterative bee named beauty lupet gives the character a specific female truth a woman on rare occasions can be beautiful and smart it has a curve it's bolden's beautiful body she knows it and oh boy she shows it this rarity of the sexy and funny woman is a blue moon phenomena and will happen again at some point for lack of a better way to say it she gets them out Look out for that car! Oh no, what car? The big car! Oh no! A film not for the faint of heart. Children under 12, pregnant women, those with pre-existing conditions, nor the epileptic for that matter. Critic Steven Sklar raves, they didn't speak French, they just spoke English with French accents. I think it was a choice. I need you to make love with me. I didn't make love. <laughs> I make six. I have never met a man as grossly attractive as you. I have never met a woman as gross or as attractive as you either. Visionary director Maurice Lupet invites you. I invite you. To experience the dynamic and visceral thrills of the French New Wave. To experience the dynamic viscera and thrills of the French New Wave. The French film that the French talk about the most to cross the channel and channel the complexities and mysteries of this new form of cinematic film and attempt to view the plethora or pain and pleasure you will soon witness. Oui. La Petite Maprise La Fou Savie de Soufflé Film Ein Dry Sein Tableau On film de Maurice Luc Lupet The film that was banned for four years. Why? Oh. I know why. I got Maurice to reflect on the marketing of Le Petit Mépris, Le Fou Sa Vie du Soufflé, film on Dry Zen Tableau, un film de Maurice Luc Lupé. We had the most beautiful woman in the world contractually obligated to show her titties. Yes, I put that in the cello of the, the war allegory. Oh, shall we watch this French drama about the war or shall I get my rocks off? Our movie has both and I'm sure many people came because of the war stuff. But I'm very sure a lot more people came because of Bulden and her bouncing boobies. <laughs> oh, my, my, ooh la la, yes. I'm not a complicated man, as a matter of fact. I'm fucking stupid. I like cinema. I like simple pleasures. Like butter in my ass and lollipops in my ass. That's just something I enjoy. What can I say? Call me crazy. Call me a pervert. But I love boobies. They are the fruit, the gift. They are God's boobies. Mr. Lupet, many people have said that your films are misogynistic and sexist. Correct. So you agree? Uh, my English is not so good. What is this, uh, how you say, sexist? Mr. Lupet, when you see a woman, what do you see? Uh, when I see a woman, I see more than just an actress. 
more than just a girl. I see a wealth of experience, hopefully a lot of talent. I see a life. I also see many orifices. I myself know of at least eight, but I am a venturer, I am explorer. <laughs> what can I say? I am the Columbus of the Anus. When I make a film, I make it my goal to show all of these things. Yes, indeed, every hole is a goal. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I just coined a phrase. And of course, her boobies. Of course, it wasn't long before Maurice's films were picked up for American distribution. And his very specific brand of highly sexualized experimental fare blew the doors off the current United States landscape of new wave cinema. Greg Riviera noted obsessive Fresh Balls fan. When I was a teen and I read the trades about the new movies and I saw that Maurice Luc Lupet was going to be directing a new Lucio Lupin comedy, I mean, that, that was the greatest day of my life. I started crying. I literally started crying, weeping. It makes me upset just to talk about it now, actually. I mean, I was a fan of Maurice's films ever since they stopped having subtitles and I had to read. That's what books are for, not movies. <laughs> Barely noted film critic Harold Ryan. Once Maurice did make his way to America from France, it became very apparent that in those early years, Maurice didn't have such a strong grasp on the English language. It would be reported often that he was directing largely through charades, which would often get the whole crew involved and turn into usually a large fun game of normal charades which in turn led to production being halted for many hours in each day. Teacher's pet, Stephen Sklar. It became very quickly apparent for all those involved with Maurice's American films that there was something missing. And then came the release of Harriet Desai's film, The Roving Woods, an experimental reworking of Macbeth. Now, this film was brilliant and exciting and thrilling and dramatic. Harriet Desai was also Lupe's partner during the period he made his five good films. Desai, of course, later confirmed what we all knew was the truth. You have, of course, directed 12 films, Harriet. Is there- 17. Pardon? I have directed 17 films. Are these five underground works? Look, I always said that I wouldn't say it whilst he was alive, but I directed the five French masterpieces credited to Maurice Luc Lupe. Pardon me? It was a boys club. They were all jerking each other off. Godard and the others. It was me and Agnes and the rest were assholes. So I started fucking Maurice, which was fine, so that I could make his films. Maurice directed the sex, which is still fine laughable. For Maurice should be in no place to devise sex on screen. Because he isn't a qualified intimacy coordinator. No, because he couldn't find my clit if it had a big bright bow on it. Look. I will only say this whilst Harriet is still alive, but Harriet is a big bitch. It is the truth. Mr. Lupe, Harriet Dees is dead. Oh shit, I thought my email was scammed. I would have gone. Funerals usually have good buffets. They have those, how do you say, beef sausage roll. And what did you mean by Harriet is a big bitch? Can I take it back? No, this is all staying in. Well, can I add? Sure. Harriet was a big bitch, but was also one of the greatest creative visionaries of her generation. Will you comment now, officially, that Harriet directed your early films, knowing that you'd be speaking ill and bastardizing the legacy of the dead? Well, that's one hell of a way to phrase that question. I did direct parts of those films. Which parts? The fucking. <sighs> <sighs> So Maurice made his mark in America making porn oh films. My. Well, back in the 70s, I was quite a revolutionary, actually. Instead of making a full feature-length film or a video, I would make 10-minute versions and release them on VHS, and then at the end it would be a black screen and it would say something like, you're about to miss the best parts, huh? <laughs> I also started another video series where people would pay for their favorite actress and then she would make videos with me that only fans could see and we thought a good name for this would be Secret Sexy Club. Oh, I'm done. It was at this stage of his career where Maurice was selected to direct Fresh Balls. The next job, of course, was casting as many of the brightest comedic stars of the era that Lucio could get his hands on. Not, of course, in the physical sense, for the most part. 
I think I'll take the elevator next time. Billy Stone was one of the first names for the film. He would, of course, be perfect for the arrogant but attractive and hilarious role of Fred Caddy. After all, Stone himself was attractive, hilarious, and a huge prick. Lucy O'Neill, film critic. I once profiled Billy Stone following his firing from the TV show Getting Schooled, where he had been accused of many a things. Just general awful antics, and I think the interview was three hours long? And I actually brought in a mentalist and a hypnotist to try and induce through subliminal language for Billy to say sorry. The closest we got was... Getting off to Dubai somewhere? Well, I'm sorry that I'm that fucking rich and I've got three jet skis and you want alimony. You shouldn't have fucked the pool boy! Billy Stone was an 80s comedy legend, but not everybody felt the same about him. His very specific brand of being the smartest guy in the room often rubbed people the wrong way. For every fan, there was an almost militant hater. I couldn't stand him. He's an insufferable ass and I could never sanction his buffoonery. He's tolerated. Billy was a god. Every man wanted to be him and every woman wanted to fuck him. Hell, I wanted to fuck him. Billy Stone had a few good movies. I liked a fair few of them. But the man was the biggest dick I've ever seen. Billy Stone had tons of great movies. I liked them all. And the man had the biggest dick I've ever seen. But he was funny. He was very funny. For every story of violence or extreme dickhead behavior, there would be another story. Well, no, actually, they were the only stories. He was just funny in the movies. The man was a total ass. There was a very specific brand of role for Billy Stone. The suave, witty, dry aesthetic that made him easy to cast in roles that fitted only that very specific set of skills. Mr. Firth, I was wondering if you'd come inside my cabin. I'm too tall, I wouldn't fit. And for that matter, I'm not much of an exhibitionist. Excuse me? You're excused. Now I have a small time massage I have to get to. Where in God's name do you think you're going? I just told you, Senator. Hey, I'll tell you how it ends. <laughs> I'm gonna put it on the state's bill if you don't mind. I most certainly do. Swell. See you later, Senator. That was a clip from the critically acclaimed comedy Senator Whippet, where Stone played a homeless dog trainer who infiltrated the Senate. The power of Stone was that he could make even the worst idea come off as vaguely entertaining. Some critics called it Capra-esque. Critic Stephen Sklar asked me to ask him what he called it. Ask me what I call it. What did you call it? Well, no. Uh, say the thing about what other people said first. About the film? Yeah. People liked the film overall. What did you- No, the thing about what they called it. Okay. Critics called Senator Whippet Capra-esque. What did you call it? Crap-ra-esque. I was quite proud of that one. That was it? Sometimes I regret my life choices. In the late 70s, Johnny Carson interviewed Billy Stone. This interview was watched by millions as many tuned in to see if Carson's infamous off-air disdain for Stone would come to bear in the interview. Carson had a couple of questions ready up his sleeve, that was fair to say. What exactly makes you the star you are today, do you think? Bribery. <laughs> <laughs> Because, of course, you have had your troubles with substances before. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, Johnny. Simple question. Well, as you know, Johnny, I have suffered with a mild IBS medication addiction. Hmm. What do you mean? I heard something fizzy, perhaps. Is this 20 questions? No, just one. It's brown and goes down easy. Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> Somebody's trying to avoid my question. I have an addiction, as I've already told you, to a certain IBS medication. You poop a lot, then? Yes, I poop a lot, Johnny. You like to do anything else in the bathrooms? Maybe go skiing? Practice your lines? I quite frankly have no idea what you're alluding to. Sound it out. What? Sound it out. Two syllables. Second one rhymes with inane. Do you want me to say it? Yeah, say it. Cocaine, Carson. Cocaine. It seems that's all we have time for on tonight's show. Tomorrow I'll have Billie Jean King and Salman Rushdie. See you then. You son of a bitch!
Carson would later in his autobiography declare his motivation for the controversial line of questioning. The following is performed by an actor. Billy Stone was an absolute asshole. There used to be a lot of talk about him being my possible replacement. Well, I wanted to stop that dead in its tracks. I hated Chevy Chase something rotten, but Billy Stone was Chevy Chase times a hundred and without the tan. You never really know how much a tan can do for a person until it's gone. Lifetime Billy Stone fan and apologist Greg Riviere. Billy Stone officially kicked his coke habit before Fresh Balls commenced filming. However, as we all know, that was hardly a sober set, and so Billy immediately went back to his old ways. Billy Stone himself talked to me as most of the actors did. Oh, the IBS thing is true. It wasn't exactly IBS, it was its own problem. In the early days, I had what was prescribed to me as an open anus issue, where my sphincter quite literally had no tension muscles and was constantly open. Hence, well, you get the picture. So it was less so IBS medication and rather the opposite of poppers. It was an anus tightener and I would sniff just like poppers and that thing would just pucker right up for a good hour or so. For those brief moments in between my anus being an open entry, it would be not unlike Fort Knox. Then and again, I use a big cork. And what about the coke? How did you become addicted to that? I don't know, really. Maybe because it's the best fucking thing in the world and I'd give my left nut for a line right now. Does that answer your question? At the time of Fresh Balls being made, however, Billy Stone was going through an entirely different life dilemma. It was announced today by Mrs. Roth's publicity agent that Rachel Roth, the famed actress, has filed for divorce from her actor husband, Billy Stone, citing irreconcilable differences, and in her own words, him being the worst man alive. I may be the worst man alive, I admit it, but I'm me. I am who I am and I'm not gonna change. And in actuality, she was fucking the pool boy. That's what was happening. We interviewed Rachel Roth to hear her side of the story. Billy who? After some prompting, she did begin to remember. Ah, well, yes. Well, technically, Alan was a pool boy. But he didn't clean the thing. I literally hired him just to bathe in the pool all day for me to watch. <laughs> Billy never questioned it because he was working. And there was something else he was doing at the time as well, I, I can't remember. Oh, that was it. Banging cocktail waitresses two at a time and blowing rails like it was going out of fashion. So I think I was in my rights to play around a little. On his dime, might I add. From what I can remember, this Allen guy was the gopher on the set of Caddyshack, before Rachel hired him. As in the guy in the suit? No. On set, a gopher is somebody who sort of runs around. Yeah, and Bill Murray chased him. No. No. Two different things. The gopher was the animal. Alan was the gopher. You think my wife left me for an animal? No. The actor inside the animal. You're being serious, aren't you? A gopher who, won who runs around. I mean... No, I said a gopher who runs around. You're saying the same thing. Except I'm not. Because one is an animal and one Mr. is a human. Stone. I understand that it's a touchy subject, but you aren't making any sense. Okay, let's table this conversation before I use a blowtorch on my fucking temple. Lucio Lapine. Billy was the easiest one to cast. He was fresh out of rehab and everybody had a close eye on him. And I said, do the movie for one million and every scene you do good, I'll give you a line. I like to think of myself as somewhat of an, uh... Enabler? I was gonna say act as producer, but sure. Look, my guys do something for me, I do a little something for them. If I could describe our interplay on set best, I would equate it to that of a seal in a water park getting fish for a trick. If that fish was like, you know, the purest fucking fish this side of Peru. That's horrific. Enabler enabling them to get filthy rich, maybe. If I hear another sob story about a coke fiend, I'm gonna lose my mind. Next was somewhat a case of reverse engineering. Lucio had signed TV star Barbara Hooper onto a three film contract at the absolute lowest price ever offered an actress in Hollywood. This contract had one film left, and that film had to be Fresh Balls. 
We talked with Barbara in her palatial estate mansion in West Hollywood that she bought in the 50s for $5,000, fully furnished, and now currently resides as a piece of land and property around the $750 million mark. When Barbara first greeted me at the door, she had a cigar in her mouth, a wine glass filled with ice, limes, gin, creme de menthe, and a splash of Kahlua in her left hand. She called it a gin mint Kahlua, which was basically just the recipe, but she thought she'd come up with a great name. In her other hand was her dog, a small poodle crossed with a Great Dane. The dog was named Delano, the second of the three crossbreed Poo Danes, Franklin, Delano, and Bashir Al-Assad. She was wearing a bikini from her younger years that, let's just say, left nothing to the imagination. And when I say that, I do mean that they were both drooping out. Welcome to my home. You must be this busybody that keeps calling to talk. Yes, and this is my producer, Bobby. You know, I used to know Bob Wagner, and to know him was to know not to go sailing with him. I hope you're recording, Missy, because I only spout gems. I've already given you one already. There's plenty more where that came from. Ha <laughs> ha! So, Bobby, you one of those new queer fellas that don't say what they are? I'm just going off your shirt, darling, not your manner. I've yet to say that. But it does on initial seem a touch, Faye, dear. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience for Tales of Your Life, Miss Barbara Hooper. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Barbara Hooper, but you already know that. He just said it. For this little program, I've been asked if I could say a few things about my childhood. Well, I don't fancy that. This is supposed to be a comedy program. The only thing funny about my childhood was how my daddy walked. But a horse kick to the head'll do it. Uh, but he only walked funny for an hour or so. A horse kick to the head'll do it. Lucio set Barbara Hooper to play the role of Delilah DeWanton, one of the sex pot wealthy patrons of the tennis club setting for fresh balls. Despite her well-known real-life exploits, the role did come as quite a shock to many due to the simple fact that second to Lucille Ball, Barbara was America's favorite mother and housewife. I was friends with Lucy, and I also thought we were on a level playing field, but then she had her shows, and I knew that that's what I needed. So I looked at what made her show such a success, and I realized the intriguing racial element to the show intrigued me. This was a white woman, and Desi was whatever he was. I want to say Puerto Rican, like Rita Moreno and Natalie Wood, but I may be wrong. But I thought the only Latin Hispanic people I know work for me, so why not make a show about them? I could be a cleaner, and my husband could be a cleaner too, and my character was called Sally Span, so I thought a funny title would be... <laughs> well, you all know the title. Unfortunately, we all do. After all, it is currently one of the only shows whose reruns had its own title bleeped out. Chevrolet, the only laxative from a car company you trust, brings you tonight's episode of and Span, starring Barbara Hooper. Hello, I'm Robert Mistel, host of the Classic Film Channel. What you're about to hear from Barbara Hooper features extremely offensive racial language to modern viewers. In light of the Black Lives Matter movement, CFC implemented a censoring policy that replaces such intense racist diatribe with a softer toned and more politically correct phrasing. However, in light of the Me Too movement, CFC also implemented a policy regarding women's voices uncensored. And so what you are about to hear is Barbara, followed by the softer tone. So just... Like, skip every other three seconds or so. I put out a casting call for a Latin Hispanic fellow who looked like what they are. Barbara put out a casting call for people of color, of Latin or Hispanic nationality. And they had to do the voice as well, otherwise it's not funny. Barbara was looking for traditional Latin and Hispanic voices to enrich the truth and comedy of the piece. And I can't lie, heading into the casting process, I was looking for a good actor. But I was also single at the time, and I'd only ever been with a black fella. Other than normal people, of course. Okay, I, 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 I think we're just gonna stop there. The show was a raging success, playing to a largely white and predominantly racist audience in the height of the 50s. 
It was the show that made her a star and set her up for life in her career and also in her financial assets, of course. Barber over the years quickly rose to have one of the most well-reported and vast wealths in the Hollywood area. So why did she end up signing for such a low bid to her three-picture deal with Lucio? I have all the money in the world, but when you're an old woman, you can't buy a goddamn leading role in this town for all it's worth. I'm what they call a lucky widow, in that I married well, have ten good years, they die, often mysteriously, and I get left it all. I think they call that a black widow. Oh no, dear, I only dated that fella, never married him. While we're on the subject, what do you say to those who question the mysterious nature of your husband's deaths? What you're trying to say? I can kill a line reading, I can't kill a Greek millionaire. You should be asking the people trying to kill me. People try to kill you? What fucking rock are you under, Missy? I talked with Harriet Lumet, author of Hooper's Heaven, an entirely unauthorized biography. I made her add the word entirely. So the book is all false? Oh God, no, it's all true. I just like a little mystery is all. Harriet Lumet. For a period of around 10 years in the 50s and 60s, Barbara was married to Zachary Luntz, who is the name that nobody particularly will know off the top of their heads, but was deeply involved with the CIA and also, of course, was an unspoken member of the Warren Commission. Barbara was married to Luntz before, during, and immediately after. Well, the Kennedy assassination. This was Barbara's only divorce, as a matter of fact, and she was reportedly paid out of the extortionate amount of $300 million, paid for largely by the CIA itself. How on earth did she get that much money? I mean, it was somewhat of an open secret that if you got two drinks in her, Barbara will tell you exactly who killed Kennedy. During the divorce and prior to the settlement, Barbara, on a late night comedy interview show, touched on the idea briefly. One man, sure, sure, I believe that. All I'm saying is you'll find a lot more answers down the bayou than you will in the Warren Report. Do not forget your fallen king. This fish stinks at the head and this fish is stinky. After the settlement, Barber was asked once more about the assassination. I believe there is no evidence to support the killer was anybody but Lee Harvey Oswald. Three shots, sixth floor. Ruby acted alone, Oswald acted alone. No collusion, no conspiracy. There, Lyndon, you happy? Next came the role of casting the daughter of Barbara Hooper's Delilah. The role was one that required immense comedic capability. But she was also our biggest chance at TNA, so she had to be hot. Now, we didn't have the time or the patience to fund the search for a woman both hot and funny. So I made the executive decision to just go with hot. Because for every 10 women I meet, I find around one or two funny, whereas I want to fuck at least nine of them. Fine. Ten. Although the film eventually cast Susie Cassie in the role of Mindy DeWanton, this was not the first choice. Initially, ah, uh, fuck me, this again. Initially, we had cast a new Playboy model by the name of Cecilia Seawood. She was, ah, God almighty, the things I do for tail. It blinds me to the truth. I swear to God, if Hitler had a great ass, I'd be right there funding the party and zigging and hiling too. And also, in our next issue, meet the new starlet of Playboy, Miss Cecilia Sayward. She's vivacious, brilliant, and vivacious. She's certain to be a star, and she's certain to wow you, and whoever else you choose to show this issue to. Whether it be your colleagues in a bizarre display of manly camaraderie, or your preteen son in a dysfunctional attempt at nostalgic affection. It's all there in this month's Playboy. On the very first day of shooting, the truth about this new star of the Playboy Mansion would come out. But we're not there just yet. So then came the job of finding our lead. Now, Billy was great, but scheduling meant he couldn't play the lead role. This character I'd created to be a sort of wacky coach to Stephen called Samson Mailer. Just a funny sort of name, and this guy was gonna be funny, he was gonna be sexy, he was gonna be great. 
it was the role of a lifetime. And it was either going to make an even bigger star of a big star or be the big break for a nobody. I love finding fresh talent, specifically female, but sometimes male, if I'm in that sort of mood. But this needed to be a star. So I did what everybody else was afraid to do at the time. Blackmail Jack Nicholson into appearing in my movie. But of course you didn't get Jack for the movie. Why was that? He blackmailed me right back. Some real fucked up shit he had on me. So I had to look somewhere else. I think I may be of some assistance. And Preston Thomas returns to the action role that made him a star. Jack Offman in the new sequel, One Fist Too Many. I saw the trailer, I thought there were pornos. I mean these titles, The Final Bang, Action Down Under, Twin Fever. When I watched them, of course, I realized that Preston really was one of our finest comedic and action and drama movie stars. I mean, he was the best. Preston loved the script too. He loved Wendy's jokes and the drama of it with the Steven stuff. He didn't know I was gonna cut all that. He bought it right away. I couldn't believe that it was that easy. Preston Thomas was unavailable for interviews due to the fact that he was dead. Thomas, however, of course, did not go on to star in the film. So we had our star. We had him. We fucking had a star in our hands. What happened? Do you really want to know? I'm kind of dedicating multiple years of my life to this. Yeah. It broke both his fucking legs. Car accident. Car accident? Are you kidding? That's what he told you. Lucio beat Preston in a card game and had his goons set on him. It was a goddamn baseball bat, not a car. That Italian bastard thinks he's Capone. But I thought Preston Thomas died in a car accident. He did! He went straight off the fucking bridge because he couldn't break with the casts on his legs. Half of the film's first budget went to legal fees to pay out the family. That's why they didn't have any money left before he got more funding. That's why Jimmy fucking Zidane is playing the fucking role. <laughs> yeah, we had to go for Jimmy. Which was undoubtedly one of the first major mistakes. I mean, it was the thrill of a lifetime. And this was the sort of role that undoubtedly would shoot me through the top of the cinematic world. I mean, what a thrill, what an adventure. It was as exciting as spelunking. We tried Woody first. It was the unspoken rule. If Woody didn't answer, call Jimmy. Yeah, I've heard that from people before, but me and Mr. Allen are so different in so many ways. I mean, I hardly sound like him or have any of those mannerisms. I, I mean, I'm not annoying to listen to or any of the other things that make him famous. The only thing he was missing was the fucking comedy. Uh, I mean, and the child bride, of course. So the cast was set. The leg was broken, which now, actually, is a little dark. But the cast was set and headed down to Florida to begin shooting at the real tennis club, the Dumont Club, which would double for a bushnet. Lucio was ready. Almost everyone was ready. But then... Then the first tornado hit. You have been listening to Out of Bounds, the true story of a true Hollywood true disaster. Episode 2, Breaking the Leg. Directed and edited by Thomas Carruthers. Written by Thomas Carruthers with additional material by Rian Holmes and William Legater. This episode's cast. Ava Robinson as Daisy Goldman. David Whiting as Billy Stone. Harry Reeves as David Frost and Senator. Jay Reef as Milton Hopkins and Stephen Sklar. Jasmine Dalton as Lucy O'Neill. Kirsten Fraser as Helena Neyman and Harriet Deze. Meg Bradley as Wendy Cruz. Molly Jennings as Harriet Lumet. Natalie Thorne as Wimbledon announcer and Rachel Roth. Rian Holmes as Barbara Hooper and French actress. Sam Mandagomi as Richard Fonday and Greg Riviera. Thomas Carruthers as Lucio Lapine, Jimmy Zidane, Johnny Carson, Robert Mustel, and French actor. William Atterton as Stephen Curtis, James Murphy, and John McEnroe. William Legater as Maurice Luc Lepet, and French film actor. With Olivia Fudala as playboy advert announcer, Josh Bellwood as Lear actor, Fern Jessup as 70s interviewer, Sierra Starman as 80s interviewer, Gigi Downing as Johnny Carson recreation actor, Leanne Baker as news anchor, 
Eve Wengel as 60s TV announcer, Bailey Amons as Preston Thomas, Hannah Morrill Farrell as 80s TV announcer, and Andrew Michael Ragg as the voice of the CFC. This show has original music by Alex Reeve and Mike Whiting, further music curation by Thomas Carruthers and Alex Reeve, acquired under a Creative Commons license. This show is produced by Rian Holmes, with artwork as well as the theme for the Classic Film Channel by William Leggetter. Certain sound effects performed by the Royal Court Theatre Vocal Effects and Foley Society. We thank you sincerely for listening and hope you tune in for the next episode, First Service at Bat. The gopher was in the film. And a gopher is an animal. And the pool boy was... You aren't making any sense. I swear to God alive!